out of all the techniques in bass fishing, I believe the Texas rig may be the best. Now don't get me wrong, crankbaits and spinners and topwaters have caught bass for a century, but there's just something special, so universal about a Texas rig soft plastic that anybody anywhere can rig one up and go catch a bass with it. But of course, with everything in fishing, the more that you as an angler can learn and improve, the more fish you're gonna catch. So in this video, I'm gonna teach y'all everything you need to know about Texas rigging your soft plastics in many detailed sections. Starting first with what I believe is the perfect hook for Texas rigging soft plastics in general. Next, we're gonna discuss whether or not you need to add a weight to your Texas rig, and if so, how heavy should it be? To go along with that section, I'm gonna talk about pegs on your line, what the purpose of them is on a Texas rig, and do you even need one? Next, I'm gonna rank the top four soft plastics that I believe are most useful to you as a bass angler. We are then gonna move on to an on-the-water demonstration of how to retrieve those soft plastics, followed by two sections on different soft plastic worms you need to put in your tackle box, the swimming worm and the big magnum worm. I don't care where you guys fish from, a big fancy bass boat, a kayak, or on the bank, this video is for you and I'm excited for you guys to learn about Texas rigs. My name's Tyler and let's begin. I'm gonna open up my hook box right here. This is my terminal tackle box. It's got tons of different types, styles, sizes, shapes of hooks in here. But the one hook that is really the only hook you're ever going to need in bass fishing is going to be this one right here. And that is the three aught wide gap hook. It is small enough to fit the profile of most soft plastic lure sizes. So worms, crawls, creature baits, we'll talk about all that. Too big of a hook and it's gonna change the action of that soft plastic, which you don't want. You want it to function the way it was designed, which most of the time is on either a three or a four aught wide gap hook. The second reason why I love this hook so much is because it has enough clearance. Now what clearance means is that when a fish bites down on that Texas rigged worm, usually Texas rigged soft plastic, it exposes that hook point, therefore giving you a chance at hooking that fish on your hook set. With too small of a hook paired with most soft plastics, they don't have enough clearance for a good hook set. And the third reason why I love this hook so much is because it usually has the right thickness, the right wire diameter to fit any style of bass fishing you're gonna go for. So unless you're going for ultra giants, eight, 10 plus pound bass, the bendiness, the strength of this hook here, that is good enough for almost any fish you're gonna catch to get it onto the bank or into the boat. The three out wide gap really is the multi-tool of bass fishing hooks. Now I've used this three out wide gap hook for many, many years. And so I wanna show you guys every single soft plastic you can rig this thing on and every soft plastic that you probably should not choose this hook for. Spoiler alert, there's a lot more that you can than you can't. Let's hop into it. The first category of soft plastic is going to be the soft plastic creature bait. Really any size creature bait works well for the three out wide gap hook. And as you can see by the rigging here on the screen, it fits it just perfectly. This here is the Strike King Game Hog. I love the Game Hog, but really if it's the Game Hog, the Space Monkey, the Rage Bug, any soft plastic creature bait out there, the three out wide gap is going to fit. And if the three out wide gap fits any kind of soft plastic creature bait, you bet your bottom dollar it fits a soft plastic craw just like this Rage Craw. Next on our list is going to be Texas rigged worms. Here I have the Strike King Ocho, the five inch version. If you're gonna throw the six inch Ocho, which I throw a ton of, you're gonna wanna beef up your hook and size a little bit to the four out wide gap. You can still throw a three out, but you'd probably run into a few clearance issues with that hook. And so when it comes to regular, you know, dimension worms here, regular, regular thickness worms like the Ocho, any other curly tail worm, as you can see on the screen, the three out wide gap fits it perfectly. The next category is going to be the soft plastic jerk bait or really any so small soft swim bait. This thing is literally designed to be used with a three out wide gap hook. As you can see, the clearance is perfect. Uh, the rigging just looks amazing on this thing. It doesn't impact the action of this lure at all. And you hook almost every single fish that gets this thing down its mouth. It is an absolute match made in heaven. And like I said, the soft plastic jerk bait, just like the Strike King Caffeine Shad or any small soft plastic swim bait, really any swim bait from like three and a half inches to five inches works pretty dang well with the three out wide gap as long as it's not too thick vertically for the clearance issues. Now I did say there are a few soft plastic lures that don't really work with the three out wide gap hook. The first of those being your standard little tiny drop shot worm. This here is the Strike King half shell worm, and it's really designed to be nose hooked on a tiny octopus hook or thrown on a one to two aught wide gap hook, usually a one aught. A three aught, I mean, it could work, but it would definitely uh, impact the action of the bait, would not allow it to have as flowy of an action because it has the bend of the hook so far down the worm, almost to the tail. So for tiny drop shot baits, maybe drop down to a one aught wide gap. 
The second soft plastic that is not really ideal for this hook is going to be a Ned rig. Ned rigs usually are thrown on a jig head. Sometimes though I've seen guys Texas rig little tiny Ned rig soft plastics like this. As you can see it fits but it doesn't really look right and while a Ned rig doesn't have really any action at all it's kind of like a little hopping piece of poop down there. Uh, a three out wide gap is still not the best hook for that. It definitely works better than a drop shot but if you're going to throw a Ned rig throw that on a Ned rig specific jig head. In the last two soft plastics that don't work with this hook are going to be a big worm and a bigger soft plastic swim bait. Now the difference between this soft plastic swim bait and this one is not necessarily size. I think this one is an inch longer so I guess it is a little bit longer but what really separates these two and makes one successful with the three out and one not is going to be the thickness and therefore the lack of clearance that hook has on this swim bait. So as you can see there on the screen it just I mean it, it fits but if a fish bites down on it it's going to have to bite down really hard and in just the perfect area so that hook point pops out but there's not really enough clearance there to really give you a good shot at catching that fish so a big swim bait like this you might need an extra wide gap hook not just a standard wide gap or you might need to up your size to a 4 out or 5 out or a specific wide gap swim bait hook and lastly like I just mentioned is going to be your big worms now while this one does have a little more clearance than the soft plastic swim bait did I still don't recommend throwing a 3 yacht on a big worm. This here is I think a big old 12 inch Strike King Magnum worm. It just doesn't really fit with a 3 yacht. Can it work? Yes. But one thing I've noticed over years and years of filming underwater footage, I've seen how bass eat a soft plastic lure, specifically a worm. Most of the time they don't go straight for the head. If they do, you're good to go because that hook will be engulfed right away. Most of the time they bite somewhere in the middle or they bite the tail and then every time they flare their gills, they suck water in and thus engulf the worm a little bit more until it's totally in their mouth. That's why we say it's good to give a Texas rig fish, a soft plastic fish, a little bit of time to eat it because most of the time, if they have that in their mouth, they're not going to drop it. Instead, they're actually going to clamp down harder and suck it farther deep into their mouth as they attempt to actually engulf the thing. Uh, that is why the three out wide gap could technically work on a big worm, but if you want a better chance of hooking a fish on a giant worm like this, throw yourself a five off. And if you're confused by what the heck an aught is, a one aught, three aught, as I talked about in this video, I have an entire video that I will link down in the video description talking about all the different hooks out there, including this one right here, talking about the hook sizes, how to determine which size and what type is best for you, and especially for you more advanced anglers, that video can be incredibly helpful in taking you to that next level in terms of catching more fish and being even more technique specific. We're going to talk about the differences between the rate of fall with your soft plastic lure weightless versus weighted. Now in order to understand rate of fall you have to know what type of soft plastic you're throwing. So I have three different types of soft plastics in my hand. Right here I have a KVD perfect plastic. It is just kind of your standard soft plastic. It's got tons of salt in it. It can sink pretty well on its own but I think in order to get it down deep you're going to have to have a weight as I'm going to talk about. But I'm actually going to break three of these soft plastics to show you the consistency of the soft plastic. So if I take this KVD fluke right here and I pull it, it takes a little bit of strength to pull it, but eventually you can rip it like that. And I'm not sure how uh, healthy this is for you, but I'm going to give each one of these a taste to tell you guys exactly why they behave the way they do. So this first lure here is very, ugh, very, gosh. That is very, very salty. And so what salt does is that it causes a lure to sink. The more infused with salt your soft plastic is, the heavier it is to cast, and of course, the, the quicker it sinks. Soft plastic two is uh, this blade minnow here, which is meant to be on the back of a swim jig, the back of a chatterbait, that kind of thing. And it is a more uh, rubbery style soft plastic, definitely less salt, and I'm gonna show that by pinching it. And there is actually literally no salt in this at all. So I guarantee it, if I was to throw this in the water, which I'm actually gonna do right now, it literally floats. Soft plastic literally floats on top of the water because it has no salt. And the third soft plastic I have is kind of the Elastec soft plastic. So if you were to see this, this regular soft plastic here, you can't really pull it that far before it breaks. It doesn't really have a whole lot of uh, elasticity. The Elastec soft plastics, I can literally pull it that far without it breaking. 
And so as you can tell, there's not a whole lot of, uh, of weakness to the structure of, the, of this soft plastic, but all three of these will fall differently in the water. And so if I was to throw all three of these in the water, my guarantee is this one is gonna sink just a tiny bit because I know it has, I can feel it, a little bit of salt in there. This one's gonna totally float because it has no salt, and this one is gonna sink because it has salt. And so you have to understand how quickly your lure sinks before applying your weight. I actually wanna see if I can break this. Gosh, holy cow. <laughs> I legit can't break the soft plastic. I can't do it. I cannot. Oh, there we go. Ow. God. So if you want to fish a finesse worm as I had here, an elastic textile worm, and you want to fish it on the bottom, you're going to have to put a weight on there. And if you're throwing a normal soft plastic with some salt, you're going to have to add a weight to get it down even deeper, even though it does have a rate of fall. So in this next part of the video, we're going to head to a pool real quick to show you guys some underwater footage of all the different sizes of weights and how quickly they cause your soft plastics to fall to the bottom. And as you can see here, we are dropping my favorite, the weightless soft plastic Cinco. This is a five inch Strike King Ocho. And as you can see, it took about six seconds to fall to the bottom of the pool, which is in five feet of water right here at the edge. And so I'm going to have another angle pop up real quick. You guys know I love throwing weightless the most. Uh, and with a generic soft plastic like this with some salt in it, it usually falls about a foot a second, sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on the line size you use. And as you can see when I'm working it back in, even hopping it off the bottom, it still takes about a second for it to fall back down, giving those fish another chance to check it out if they're a little finicky. But here we moved on to 16th ounce weight. This is an unpegged, most of these are going to be unpegged here, uh, just to show you guys the difference between pegged and unpegged. Uh, and 16th is one that I use a ton. 16th and 8th, as you'll see in a second, are the two that I use the most often. And as you can see, 1, 2, 3, 4. Takes about four seconds, at least counting from one, to get from the uh, top of the water to the bottom in five feet of water. And on eighth ounce, as you'll see the next one here, one, two, about two, two and a half seconds to get to the bottom. So as you would expect from 16th to eighth, the, uh, the time it takes to drop drops in half. And as you can see by working it back along the bottom, it doesn't really have a whole lot of time for it to get back down there. So again, this is a situation where you have to get your worm, your lure a little bit deeper, but of course it will mean that it falls faster. Now here, we went all the way to half ounce. And this is really the heaviest that I'm gonna go when it comes to fishing uh, weighted soft plastics. As you can see, it falls in, you wanna, what do you give it, one second from the bottom? Zero, one, yeah, it takes about one second for it to fall. And that is just way too fast in most situations for my liking. So we're gonna switch to a pegged weight. This is a pegged 16th ounce. And as you can see, it actually kind of spirals down there. I, I didn't realize until I was watching this footage how much your soft plastic moves throughout the water column on the x-axis um, when you have your weight pegged. So it kind of spirals down there like a tube does. But as you can see, the weight never separates from the worm. So that right there is what a pegged weight looks like. And lastly, I'm going to show you guys what it looks like for the belly-weighted hook, as I mentioned. As you see, the bait falls down in the water, and it falls exactly how I talked about, with it shimmying down, doesn't fall nose forward, it falls directly uh, flat across the x-axis, and it shimmies as it goes down. Now, of course, this hook is too big for that fluke. It's a four-inch fluke with an eight-odd hook, but as you can see there, it definitely falls directly straight down. The next thing that I wanted to bring up when it comes to picking your weight for your soft plastic is you have to understand that the heavier the weight you use, the more it digs into the bottom, and this applies for both pond anglers and boat anglers. So let's say you're fishing in and around a uh, chunk rock. The heavier weight you use, the easier it is for that weight, because of how heavy it is, to snuggle its way into rocks and to get stuck. So of course, I recommend the lightest you can get away with around rocks, especially big chunk rock, the better because you're not gonna lose as many lures. And when it comes to the pond anglers, a lot of ponds out there just have nasty bottoms. They have slime, they've got muck, they've got mud, uh, you know, dirty sand. And the heavier soft plastic you have, as you're dragging and hopping it across the bottom, not only is that weight going to be collecting that nasty grass, you have to constantly be cleaning off your lure after every single cast because it's digging into the bottom too much. And one other thing that a lot of people don't think about is that when it hops across the bottom, it disturbs the bottom. 
Sometimes, in the case of a football jig, I want it to disturb the bottom and cause a trail for that fish to follow and be able to find the lure. But if you're fishing in a dirty water situation, and, I mean, and the fish are having a hard time finding your lures anyways, I don't think it's very advantageous for you to be stirring up the bottom and making it harder for the fish to eat your lure. So again, you have to be cautious when it comes to selecting weights that are too heavy because they might get you down there faster, you might be able to make more casts, but it might kind of turn those fish off by seeing the bottom be so disturbed by such a heavy weight. And of course, the heavier the weight, the more it makes noise across the bottom, which in some situations you want. But in most cases, fishing a soft plastic, I want it to be um, as finessey as possible. And let's face it, throwing a weightless soft plastic in 10 feet of water, it takes a long time for that bait to get to the bottom, which of course is where you want your Texas rigs to be. It is a bottom contact lure. And so if you take nothing else from this video, I'm gonna go on a detour for one second. Make sure you understand if you're a beginner angler, you can't fish this thing slow enough. You cannot let this thing get on the bottom enough. It is a bottom contact lure. Fish want a Texas rig for the most part. Drag and hop in across the bottom. That's where the fish are. That's where they're going to be feeding. And that's where you need your Texas rig to be. And so if you're throwing weightless in 10 feet of water, it's going to take a long time for the bait to actually get down there to the bottom. That is why most anglers opt for throwing a weight on your Texas rig. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you just want to make sure, as we're going to talk about in the next section, you don't go too heavy on your weights. You actually go on the light side of things because a weightless soft plastic takes a while to get to the bottom in 10 feet. But just adding a 16th ounce weight or an eighth ounce weight will almost double your speed at getting that soft plastic down to the bottom. And sometimes that's all you need. You don't need the soft plastic once it hits the water to be at the bottom in like three seconds. You can wait a few seconds for it to get down there and it'll give you a much more natural presentation as you hop or drag that soft plastic back to you as opposed to using a heavier weight, which of course would get it down there faster, but in my experience has more negatives than positives. A peg, as you can see from right there on my hand, is a little tiny piece of rubber or plastic that either slides onto your line before you rig the rest of your Texas rig, or it'll stick into the top or the nose of your, of your worm weight. And it really accomplishes one main thing, and that is to take two separate entities, your weight and your Texas rig, whether it's a worm, creature bait, soft plastic, anything, and it makes them one cohesive package. So without a peg, your weight is free to slide along the line, and with a peg, they are one cohesive package. That's what a peg does. But Tyler, if you're telling me that I shouldn't be pegging my Texas rigs, why are you even telling me what a peg is if they're not that useful? Well, there is one specific use case for a peg. We're gonna get into that here in a second. But first I wanna cover why, for the most part, I leave my Texas rigs with a weight unpegged. So I'm not a fan of anything that keeps my hook from penetrating the inside of a fish's mouth. And believe it or not, a Texas rig weight, especially the bigger up in size you go, has a tendency to do that. So imagine this weight right here as a battering ram. A battering ram is used by either an army or an individual to force their way into a heavily fortified uh, castle, building, door, whatever it is, by using force to knock the door open or knock it down. And you might be thinking, how the heck does that apply to bass fishing? Well, when a fish clamps down on your entire Texas rig, the larger the weight size, the easier it will be for when you swing back the hook, that weight to basically like open up the mouths of that fish. I heard Shaw Grigsby talk about this years ago and I've seen it in my own fishing situations. It literally will force their mouth open and oftentimes move their mouth just enough to where that hook either doesn't penetrate very well and you lose a fish on the fight or you just totally swing and miss or you swing and it feels like you hooked them but the Texas rig just slips right out. I believe that is because the Texas rig weight is acting as a battering ram to blow open the mouths of those fish, especially if you have the weight pegged because if you have the weight pegged they have no choice but to eat the entire thing in their mouth now in comparison when your weight is free we're gonna take the uh, the bobber stopper away for a second and the fish bites that soft plastic Texas rig that weight slides down the line I have seen it when filming underwater footage for years and years now and then they have a light thing to suck even farther back in their mouth thus allowing an even better hookup ratio I'm telling you guys having your Texas rig weight not pegged will lead to a whole lot better hookup ratio and more fish in the boat now let's talk about when you should peg your Texas rig weights and that specific situation is going to be when you're fishing a Texas rig around heavy cover and the two most common types of heavy 
cover are going to be heavy matted aquatic vegetation, so a punching scenario, and then shallow bushes, shallow wood that especially gets extra thick, extra bushy. That is where you want to put a peg on your Texas rig weight. Because your entire goal with fishing heavy cover with a Texas rig is to get your Texas rig farther down deep, farther in there than any of your buddies are because that's most likely where the bass are going to be living. Now once you set the hook, trying to get those fish out, that's a whole other challenge in itself. But if you don't get your Texas rig to where they live, you're not even going to get the bite. And so, so let's say my hand right here is a, is a mat of aquatic vegetation that's all stuck on the surface of the water and you want to get underneath it. That soft plastic is going to be flipped here, oftentimes the weight will slip its way through, but the soft plastic will not because it's not heavy enough to force its way through. So you're not even gonna get the bait in the area where the fish live. So that is where pegging your weight comes in handy because you flip this thing onto that aquatic vegetation, boom, it's gonna slip right through to where the fish live. That's the only scenario in which I use uh, a peg on my Texas rig weights. So if you're gonna be fishing around heavy cover, let me show you how to rig a peg correctly. Really not that difficult, but I feel like it still needs to be talked about in this video. So a peg, these here are the six cents ones. There's tons of different brands they basically all accomplish the same thing. I just like these because they're black and most of the weights that I throw are green pumpkin or black. So you're gonna take your line right here and you're gonna feed it usually into a loop as you can see there on the screen, a wire loop that it provides. You'll stick your line all the way through and then grabbing the base of the peg area, slide that peg up onto your weight. Sometimes it may be difficult at the start because you are having to pull the peg over two pieces of line. But once you get it past that, you'll see it kind of caused a little crimp in your line there. Make sure that when you're tying your knot, you do not include that in the knot tying process. Make sure you slide your peg down that line enough to give you plenty of room to tie your knot. Next, you're gonna take your bullet weight and you're going to slide it onto the line, poking through the nose, the skinnier end of the weight first. I, trust me, we've all done it before where we rig up our entire Texas rig only to realize the weight is backwards. So we got it on there correctly, just like that. And now it's time to use plenty of line here to get away from that crimp that was caused and tie our Texas rig hook on. Once you've tied it, cut off the tag end relatively close within a millimeter or two to the eye. Take your soft plastic, rig it just like a Texas rig should be. And once you have the soft plastic on your wide gap hook, you wanna slide that peg down to where it touches the weight. There's no need to go super hard to like squish that thing in there. The peg should be strong enough. Anything up to an ounce, sometimes over an ounce, if you're fishing heavy, heavy vegetation, you need two pegs on there to really keep that weight up close to the soft plastic. But just like that, again, take it, slide it down, and you have yourself a peg Texas rig. The order in which I'm gonna talk about these soft plastics is going to be least versatile to most versatile. But of course, if it made the list at all, it's pretty dang versatile. Let's start with number four, and that is the soft plastic swim bait. Now, the thing I love most about the versatility of the Raid Swimmer, any soft plastic swim bait, is going to be the amount of ways you can actually rig this thing. You can rig this thing Texas rig style, either weightless or on a belly weighted hook. You can thread this swim bait on a singular jig head like the Outcast Tackle Golden Eye swim bait head. And let me tell you, that is a smallmouth bass smasher. A soft plastic swim bait makes for a fantastic swim jig trailer. It makes for a great spinner bait trailer if you want to add a little bit of bulk to your spinner bait. And if the fish are really targeting in on bait fish, you can throw this thing on the back of a vibrating jig. Matter of fact, a lot of people only throw swim baits on the back of their white or shad color patterned vibrating jigs. And when it comes to location, it is versatile both shallow, mid depth, and deep. But I think it has one big downfall in that it's it's not versatile really in a lot of water conditions. So dirty water, it is really hard for a swim bait, at least on its own, to attract fish. It doesn't give that much vibration. Even though it has a paddle tail, I can't imagine down in the water, it's really that loud. And there are many times for me throughout the year, whether I'm on the bank or in the boat, that the fish just don't want to eat a moving bait. They want something sitting on the bottom, dragged across the, the, the rocks, the grass lines, and this thing just doesn't really, at least in my experience, fit well for a slower fishing application. It is a moving bait on its own that can also help add bulk and action to other moving baits. So that's the biggest downfall for me for the soft plastic swim bait, but it still made the list. It's pretty versatile. But let's move on to lure number two in the list of most versatile soft plastics, and that's going to be the soft plastic jerk bait. The soft plastic jerk bait, or also known as the Kleenex name, the Fluke, is a fantastic lure to catch bass no matter your 
situation, especially pond anglers, all year round. And that's honestly one of its biggest strengths is that this thing works all 12 months of the year, at least for me where I live and, and fish around in the south. Some of my favorite seasons to throw this soft plastic are during the spawn and post spawn, especially with bluegill, watermelon red, green pumpkin colors. When those fish are feeding on and protecting their nests from bluegills and shallow perch, I can't tell you one better lure than this one right here. For a lot of lakes around the country, summertime has schooling action, which means the bait fish get all balled up in the middle of the lake, the middle of the channel, and bass of all sizes will basically take advantage of that situation and will blow up on top water, oftentimes in the middle of the lake. And a soft plastic jerk bait like the Strike King Caffeine Shad is one of the best ways to target those, especially weightless. In the fall, the bass start moving from deeper water where they are in the summer up to the banks, whether it's on a main lake bank, main lake point, or out in the back of a pocket. And even in the winter time, you can throw this thing for lethargic bass. My favorite pond technique in the winter, I guess favorite pond technique is going to be a drop shot, but my second favorite is one of these on a weightless Texas rig, extra, extra slow. Just letting this thing sink in deep water all the way to the bottom and giving it a slow twitch. You can catch bass all winter long doing that. And one more thing about versatility with this is that you can throw it in all water depths. I'd say shallow and mid depth is better than deep usually, but if you want to throw it shallow, throw it on a weightless Texas rig style or a Tex post style. If you want to get it a little bit deeper to a deeper grass line, or maybe you want to fish deeper docks, put a belly weighted hook on this thing, just like you did the soft plastic swim bait. I love the way this thing falls, especially the caffeine shad on a belly weighted hook. Now, the reason why this lure is not higher on the list is because there are two glaring downsides. The first is water clarity. Now, I would say, this thing, because it, it darts back and forth a little bit better than a soft plastic swim bait does, I personally will throw it in a little bit uh, darker, dingier water than I will a swim bait, at least by itself. Now, a, sw a swim bait can be rigged on the back of a vibrating jig or a spinner bait, which of course is way better uh, in dirty water than this thing by itself. But if we're going to compare each the swim bait and the, the soft plastic jerk bait by themselves, I will feel more comfortable jerking this thing around in dirtier water. But of course, clear water is definitely better. So that's a limitation of the soft plastic jerk bait. But the biggest downfall of this lure is the fact that you can't really rig it any other way besides a Texas rig or a Tex pose type rig. And really you're limiting the style of hook to just a wide gap or extra wide gap hook on this thing. This lure is really not designed to be thrown on a jig head by itself. I know guys for the Demiki rig or what's called moping in Canada, I know a lot of guys use it for that, but for you pond anglers, you're not gonna throw this on a, on a single jig head. You're gonna throw a soft plastic swim bait like a smaller Rage swimmer on that. And I've never really tried to use these things as a vibrating jig, normal jig or spinner bait trailer because all they would do is add bulk, not really any action. I feel like I'm gonna pick a swim bait as a trailer over this thing. But the reason why I'm ranking this thing above the swim bait in terms of versatility is because of the weather and year round conditions in which this thing works over the swim bait. Now, moving on to the second most versatile soft plastic lure, let's talk about the five and seven inch finesse worm. The finesse worm is probably my biggest confidence lure, especially here in the northern country where I'm filming this video because it can be fished so many places in so many different ways. You can throw a finesse worm on a shaky head, and shaky heads are great for rocks, for grass, around docks. There's so many places a shaky head works. And very similar to a shaky head that is weedless, we have a very much non-weedless option called the jig worm. You can throw a finesse worm on a drop shot. So whether you're brush pile fishing, deep rock fishing, grass fishing, anywhere fishing, a drop shot works. You can put a straight shank hook or a small wide gap on a finesse worm and even cast it around as a Texas rig. I can't say that I've done it a whole lot because I'd rather throw it as a shaky head or a jig worm, but you can do it. And staying in the same vein, you can throw it as a Carolina rig bait. It is fantastic on a sea rig out deep. This thing floats up in the air and slowly flutters back down, enticing a bass to eat it. And where can you throw a finesse worm? You can throw it stinking anywhere. You can throw it in one foot of water, in five feet of water, or 75 feet of water. I think the deepest I've ever caught a bass on a finesse worm on a drop shot was 110 feet of water. There's really nowhere a finesse worm doesn't work. Now for me personally, Water clarity hasn't been a downfall for the finesse worm because it comes in so many different colors and you can place it next to cover and leave it there, especially on a shaky head, a drop shot, or a Carolina rig. I have found zero downfalls with even dingy or dirty water. I just throw on a purple June bug, black trick worm, and I've caught plenty of fish in dirty water on those. And this thing doesn't just work when the water is warm. It works all year round. I throw 
it here up north for offshore fish in the summer. I throw it down south in the summer for offshore fish. When it is a cold front in December, I am throwing this thing on a drop shot. And heck, if I'm skipping this thing around docks on a Nico rig or a wacky rig, especially for deep spotted bass, I'll even put some catches on the screen here of my good buddy Alton Jones Jr. on the Bass Pro Tour on Smith Lake using a finesse worm just like this 7 inch one right here with a nail weight as a Nico rig skipping it around docks on Smith Lake to catch spotted bass. This thing works all over the place in every condition. Now when it comes to downsides of the finesse worm, I really don't think there are a whole lot, but the reason why it lands at number two is because it really can't be used as a trailer of any kind. So yes, there's tons of ways to rig it, tons of places to throw it in times of the year to throw it, but it doesn't fit as a trailer, which causes it to not be the most versatile soft plastic lure out there. So what is that? Let's get to number one. The number one soft plastic lure in my tackle box, whether I'm on the bass boat or on the bank, and yes, I'm zooming into my face for dramatic effect, that lure is the soft plastic creature bait, and I think the best one is the Strike King Rage Crawl. Me and this thing go way back. I caught fish in some videos on my channel almost 10 years ago on the Rage Crawl. This thing has been in my boat ever since I got a bass boat. And this style craw right here lands as number one on my list because it has zero downsides. There is no reason to ever not throw this thing in all conditions, in all water clarities, as a jig trailer or by itself, this thing stinking works. You want to throw this thing as a trailer on a vibrating jig? Great. Snip off the top portion, thread it on, and you're good to go. And you want to put this thing on a normal jig and skip it underneath docks or flip it in laydowns? Fantastic. Cut off two or three ribs, thread this thing on, and you have a perfect skipping surface right there. But jig trailers is not the only place this thing is good for. You can throw it by itself on a Texas rig, on a wobble head, on a Carolina rig, either shallow or deep, clear water or muddy water. Claws on a cross style lure like this put out vibration, they put out water disturbance, and let me tell you, it catches fish everywhere. I've caught fish on this thing on a football jig in December, on a football jig in June, on the back of a swim jig around shallow grass, on a shaky head around deeper rock. This thing just stinking works. Are there any downsides? In my opinion, no. I think this lure right here is the most versatile soft plastic lure you can have in your tackle box. And of course, there are many different soft plastic brands out there that you might be fans of that make a similar craw to this. I'm just biased because I've been using the Rage Craw for a long time. I have supreme confidence in it, and I love the design and form factor. I think it fits for so many different applications. We're gonna talk about the Texas Rig Senko. The Texas Rig Senko is one that I talk about all year long. This here is, uh, I guess the Senko is the, the name brand for them, but this here is the Strike King Ocho. I think the Ocho is one of the best soft plastic Senkos out there. And so, as kind of the name implies, it is a sink, it's, it's, a, it's a sink O. You know, you want it to sink O very, o very deep and O very far. And so, just like the Wacky Rig, you want to cast it out there, really anywhere you want. It can be an open bank, it can be structure, whatever. And you let it sink to the bottom. As I mentioned earlier, it's very, very important for almost all these. You let them sink to the bottom. Now with this one, I may employ a kind of a lift. I may employ a faster hop like that, or I may let it sink to the bottom and then drag it just like this. So you're gonna have to test out different retrieves to find out which one the bass prefer, but it is pretty simple. You let the stick bait sink, as the name is called, they sink go. Let it sink to the bottom. Of course, uh, if you're in, with, with any of these soft plastics, if you're in any water deeper than six to eight feet, you probably have to add a little bit of a bullet weight to the front of the soft plastic before you rig the hook on, um, or a belly weighted hook for a lot of these works as well. It's where the, uh, the, the weight uh, of the hook is actually like um, cemented onto the, the, uh, the bend of the hook. And so instead of being uh, a bullet weight on the top. And so just very simple. All you do with the Texas Rig Senko, cast it out there, let it sink. As you can tell, I never really engage my spool until I actually see that it's fully sunk down to the bottom. And then I just lift it up like this and let it sink. And oftentimes you'll feel a very distinct thud when you're throwing one of these and you reel down and you set the hook. So with the Texas Rig Senko out of the way, we're gonna talk about the Texas Rig Creature Baits. 
So this here is a Strike King Space Monkey, one of my favorite soft plastic creature baits. And I, uh, I think I talked about two or three different variations of this in my rigging video. I'm just gonna kind of talk about the broad categories. Most of the time when I'm working these, it is uh, kind of generic across the whole board as to how it goes. You can fish a Space Monkey, you can fish a, a beaver style bait, you can fish a big, uh, you know, game hog, brush hog, uh, more traditional creature bait. They're really all about the same. And I work, work this one usually with a bullet weight on the front just to get it down there a little bit. Sometimes weightless, but mostly with a bullet weight. And I'll cast it out there. And guess what I'll do? You guessed right, I'll let it sink to the bottom. Now with the creature bait, I am mostly slowly kind of lifting to the side. So it's like more of a lift drag or I'm totally dragging it. There's not many times unless I'm like hopping it on a jig head that I actually take a, a, a creature bait and I hop it like this, like I would with a jig or with the Texas Rig Cinco. Most of the time I'm casting it out there and I'm kind of pulling it to the side like this, usually with one hand and just feeling the bottom just like this. A drag is fully dragged down like this. Occasionally I do that if I have it on a Carolina rig or a heavier Texas rig out deep. But if I'm fishing fairly shallow, it's kind of at a uh, one and a half to two o'clock, uh, you know, angle of your, of your rod tip. And I'm kind of just slowly pulling and letting those claws down there do their work. So again, creature bait is pretty dang simple. And as long as it's on a Texas rig, it has the same power hook set as your Senko did. Let's go to one that is not finesse and that is the punch bait. So I talked about the punch bait a little bit. It is definitely more of a niche application if you're a beginner bass fisherman. And if, especially if you don't live around any sort of lakes with grass or vegetation or lily pads, I would suggest against punching because the goal of punching or, or flipping a, a heavy weight on a soft plastic is, uh, is, is to get those fish out of heavy cover. If you don't have access to heavy cover like grass or vegetation, uh, I would say you skip this part. But when you're throwing a, a, a punch rig, of course it's going to be very heavy. You're going to want to flip it out there right into the middle of the mat, right on the edge of the vegetation, really anywhere, kind of figure out where those fish want to be. And then you reel in all of your slack and just like the Texas rig, you have your rod tip like this and you give it a quick hop up like this. Maybe even kind of two hops as you go up. You work it one to, I don't know, one to four times per area. Then you reel it in and give it another flip out there to another piece of cover or vegetation. Let it sink to the bottom. Give it one or two, three, three hops. One big hop, let it sink again. All right, that area is exhausted. I'm gonna go back over here, flip it out again, let it sink, boom. And this is a lot more fast action, uh, you know, action, action packed type of bass fishing. And uh, usually not casting this, of course, never dragging it. It is almost always a flipping and pitching type of technique. So I'm just kind of finding a piece of grass. That looks good out there. I flip it out there. I let it sink. I hop it once or twice. And that bite is gonna feel like somebody just uh, lit a fire under your lure. And so you're gonna have to light a fire under that fish and set the hook like your life depends on it. So punch rig is fairly simple, but it's definitely one of those techniques that uh, not everybody has access to or really wants to do, but it is one of the biggest uh, large fish producers. So if you wanna catch a giant, punching is definitely the way to go about doing that. And I showed you all how to rig it in last time's video. Now, after we've talked about every lure that goes on the bottom of the water column, we're gonna talk about one that's kind of a hybrid between working very, very fast in the top of the water column and working slowly on the bottom, and that is your soft plastic jerkbait. If you had to ask me what my favorite pond lure is, I'd probably say either a lipless crankbait or a soft plastic jerkbait. This here is a Strike King caffeine shad. I love this thing because it imitates both bluegill and any sort of clear translucent white bait fish. And what makes this lure special is that there's actually a lot more ways to work it than there is a normal Texas rig. So I do have it on a three-aught wide gap hook right here but I'm gonna cast it out there, and depending on the, the mood of the fish is gonna be how I work it. So if those fish are schooling on bait fish, say a shad spawn situation, and they're really ravaging a bait fish population, you're not gonna to wanna to let it sink to the bottom because you don't have to. You can make way more casts, uh, a lot more presentations into more areas, and probably catch more fish the faster you work it. So if I'm gonna cast it out there for a shad spawn type deal, cast it, let it sink a, a second, and then I'm going like this. I'm going twitch, 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 
twitch, twitch, twitch, almost like walking the dog with a top water. And I'm twitching this thing very fast while keeping it six inches to a foot under the surface, sometimes breaking the surface with it. And oftentimes a fish will come up and, uh, and just slam it. So like you saw there, very, very fast retrieve, let it sink a foot. This retrieve for the soft plastic jerkbait is very popular when you have very aggressive fish, uh, like schooling fish, any fish that are eating a herring population. So herring shad, like, uh, like Hartwell, like Kiwi, any of those herring lakes, or really any time you have bass that are just gorging themselves very, very much on shad. But the other way that I like to work it is similar in a sense to the Texas rig. Well, let's say if bass are eating a bluegill, so I throw a green pumpkin or watermelon red colored fluke. I'm gonna cast it out there usually weightless if it's shallow, and if it's any deeper than five feet, I'll throw it on a belly-weighted hook. I love the way it shimmies down with a belly-weighted hook, really looks like an injured bluegill. And then any deeper than 10 feet, usually don't throw a soft plastic jerkbait, usually uh, you know, opting for some other kind of uh, technique. And so, cast it out there, let it sink to the bottom, and I'm gonna, instead of lifting it up, I'm gonna kinda give it two or three jerks up. So kind of imagine looking down at the bait and you see the, the soft plastic jerk bait kind of go boom, 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 and then float back to the bottom. So it imitates uh, what you would see as a, a, a bluegill kind of dying as it falls down and then kind of gives a few last little spurts of energy and then dies back down again. And almost all of your bites, if not all of them will come after you've popped it three times and it's starting to sink back down to the bottom, your bass will grab it and you'll kind of you know, pick up and feel your line, or on your next hop up, you'll feel the pressure on there, and then you'll sit, you'll, you'll lower your rod tip down and set the hook. So soft plastic fluke, very, very versatile, and one of my favorites to catch bass all around the country. The swimming worm is one of my favorite worms to throw because it can be used in so many different situations and a lot of people don't throw it. And so I feel like it catches fish that see lures that look almost identical but are not exactly the same. The worm that I have today is the Strike King Rage Tail Cutter Worm. It is literally just a, a stick worm, a Cinco, with a cut tail on the end, a Rage Tail cut on the end, which serves as a big paddle when that worm is going through the water. Uh, the worm, when you are swimming it, literally has the coolest little uh, tail wo wobbling action that entices back Bass to eat. And so as I talked about, it is meant to be swum. So how do you rig this dang thing? First things first, when you throw this, you're gonna have to have a weight. And so in order to have a weight and keep it as part of one unit, you know, you want this thing to be able to swim through all sorts of cover, you need a bobber stopper. So we've got a bobber stopper right here. I'm gonna feed my line through. And just like that, the bobber stopper's on. Then, you know, with, with the swimming worm being, in my experience, mostly a shallow lure, less than five feet of water is where I swim the worm, I'm gonna pick up a 16th ounce tungsten weight. It's about the smallest tungsten weight you can find, and so I thread that on there just, uh, of course, after the bobber stopper, and then I'll tie on a four-aught wide gap hook. I guess you could kind of throw a, uh, a normal wide gap hook, not an extra wide gap, even a straight shank, whatever you wanted. You just wanna make sure you have enough clearance for the hook to easily poke out of the worm. Now, since this worm is designed to be swam through the water, I don't have to throw it on a super heavy duty Texas rig style combo. In this pond we have today, it's relatively open. There's a few lay downs here and there, but not a whole lot to get stuck on. And so I like to throw the 7-2 medium because I want to allow the fish to load up on the rod a little bit slower and more consistent than a normal Texas rig hook set. And so I'll explain when I'm working this bait here in a second, but you just want to make sure that you're not pulling the worm out of that fish's mouth too soon. And that's where the 7-2 medium comes into play. So as long as you have a decently strong hook set and you're kind of swinging into them, you're going to get the hook into that fish. And so of course, as I talked about a second ago, a Texas rig it, I have the weight pegged. That way it is one cohesive unit that can swim through the water. And so I'm going to cast it out there and 99% of the time, I'm going to let it hit the bottom. If I'm fishing it in a super shallow situation, like a swim jig uh, would be in, you know, super shallow uh, lily pads, that kind of thing, I may not actually let it sink all the way to the bottom. But out here in this pond, not really a whole lot of stuff to get stuck on, really nothing at all besides a few lay down trees here and there. Let it sink to the bottom, and then I'm gonna reel in my slack, lower my rod tip down. I'm gonna reel it most of the time my rod tip down, and I'm gonna slowly start winding back in. In this scenario here, keeping it as close to the bottom as I can, because these fish are cruising around looking for stuff to feed up on here in the fall. Keeping the worm as close to the bottom, reeling it basically as slow as I can, and as soon as you feel that bite, you're going to set the hook almost with like a spinnerbait sweep up sort of thing. So it's not gonna be a get the bite 
reel down and yank on them. That's just not what you need to do with the swimming worm. And that's why I throw the 7.2 medium because I like to have that length to get this thing extra far out there but I don't need to set the hook ultra hard because these fish are feeding on it like they would be feeding on a swim jig or a spinner bait and so, or a crank bait. And so that does not necessitate a super hard hook set as long as you have the hook, you know, just on the, on the edge of being exposed on your Texas rig. And it's gonna really feel like you're not reeling in a whole lot. It's, it's gonna feel like you're reeling in a Senko because that, uh, that tail on the end, that rage tail, doesn't give your, your rod a whole lot of vibration, but it does send a kick through the water and so you just feel like you're kind of reeling in a Cinco. And then as soon as you get that bite, you'll feel a tick. And usually the fish eats it coming from behind. So it'll knock your bait forward, causing a little bit of slack in your line, which you then reel in and set the hook. And the bass are gonna eat it most times when it's swimming. But if you wanna work it regular as well, you have the liberty to do that because you have a Texas rig. Uh, you can flip this worm in trees, uh, you can skip it under docks, but I found that open water, grass line sort of thing is where the swimming worm really excels. So let's begin by talking about the why of soft plastic worms as an entire category. Now, why do bass eat a worm like this cutter worm right here, or really any worm? I have absolutely zero clue. A worm looks nothing like the main forage of any body of water, at least to my knowledge out there, so it's definitely not a match the hatch sort of thing. I believe that it is just as simple as the fish has got to eat and anything that looks edible, they're going to eat. I mean, heck, a soft plastic worm looks edible enough to me. Now that we've covered that, let's discuss the why of the big worms. So why do bass eat a big soft plastic worm, especially over a small one? Well, I believe it is because it looks like it's an easy meal and it's perceived, at least by the fish until they get hooked, that it is full of nutrients and good for them. The way that all forms of wildlife get bigger is by eating more food and having to move and work less in order to get it, especially when it comes to humans. Fat people would not be nearly as fat if they had to travel across town via bicycle in order to eat the next slice of cake. Bass are the exact same way. They cannot survive and get big if they are consistently moving around too much to have to find and eat food. They would rather eat more food in one location and call that their home. That will get them nice, fat, and healthy. So that is why big lures oftentimes catch big fish because the big fish are big for a reason. They've learned to eat a lot of food and when they see a lot of food in their face, they want to eat it. So first we have the curly tail worm. What do you need to rig the curly tail worm? Well, first off, you need a Texas rig hook, preferably a five or a six sot. I know Tyler, that's a big hook. The reason why you need such a big wide gap hook is because, well, this is a big worm. And the hook that fits this worm best is a five or a six aught. Now, do you need a weight? Yes, you do. I like to throw either a 16th, an eighth, or a three 16th ounce weight. I might go up to a quarter or even bigger if I'm throwing this in brush piles, but most of y'all watching do not fish brush piles that often. And so a eighth ounce weight like this one right here works perfect. Now, when it comes to your gear, your rod, your reel, and your line, what do you need for big soft plastic worms? Worms fish deep. This combo right here, the Lose Mach 1, can work. It's a 7.2 medium heavy. But in my experience, with a hook thickness like most wide gap hooks and big shaky heads have, it is incredibly helpful to have a heavy action rod. I love throwing a 7.3 to a 7.6 heavy. That way the longer rod length helps to set the hook on a super long deep cast. And that heavy power fast action helps to drive this thick hook out of the soft plastic and into a fish's mouth. And with line, I am almost always throwing 17 or 20 pound fluorocarbon, hardly ever 15 or less. Like I said, it is a thick wire hook with a long cast. There's gonna be stretch and you're gonna to have to have some major power without breaking off. 17 or 20 pound definitely helps with that. So now that we know how to rig the giant soft plastic worm, let's head on the water and see how to retrieve these worms. So when it comes to big worm retrieves, you really have three main retrieves. The first one is gonna be your standard Texas rig retrieve that I think is kind of built into everybody's brains when they first pick up a soft plastic worm or a creature bait. And that is just kind of a hop off the bottom, moving your rod tip anywhere from two inches to a foot and a half to get that bait off the bottom a little bit and back to you. And it takes about, I don't know, a minute to get that bait back to the bank or back to the boat. That's your first retrieve. It can work great. The second retrieve is what I call a Carolina rig drag. And that's where you take your rod tip, you lower it, 
and you drag just barely up. I'm talking just barely above a straight drag sideways. That way it gets the worm's tail moving and gets off the bottom just a few inches before it comes to rest on the bottom again. It is crucial with a big worm after a drag like this to of course, one, let it get to the bottom. That's commonplace with every soft plastic lure. But second, make sure you're reeling in all of your slack to where the next time you start your drag, you have almost no slack in your line. That way you're pulling on tight line, slack. Let it sit there. You can even reel in your slack as you let it sit on the bottom for a few seconds. You can definitely vary how fast you drag the worm, but that is retrieve number two. Now the third retrieve is definitely different and it's something you might not have thought about when retrieving a big worm. And that's what's called a stroke. A stroke is when you take your fishing rod and instead of doing a short hop, like a traditional Texas rig, you do a fast, big hop, just like that. And what a big stroke accomplishes is it creates a reaction strike for a fish that might be looking at your worm down there, deciding not to eat it until it starts to escape from the bass's reach. That's oftentimes when they will chase it down. Bass are a lot faster than you give them credit for. They will chase down a fast moving worm and absolutely nail that thing. A stroke is definitely not the most common worm retrieval, but it can work. So make sure you try it out before you give up on the big worm. The last thing to discuss is where to throw your big soft plastic worms. The biggest key for me is staying deep. I have not found much success with both the big straight tail worm or the big curly tail worm when it comes to shallow water. And as a matter of fact, as I've been filming this video over the past few days, I've cast both of these worms in shallow water and watched the bass in these ponds swim away from my worm. I think in shallow water, especially shallow clear water, it's kind of too big of a presence. Again, this is personal anecdote, but I think the fish are more likely to eat something in shallow water that's more finessey, a little finesse worm, soft plastic, you know, fluke, soft plastic creature bait, little swim bait, as opposed to a big worm. These are meant for more deep styles of fishing. And you'll notice in that Bassmaster tournament, those hook sets were some pretty dang big hook sets. That's because those guys were fishing deep and they needed a big, strong, heavy hook set and a longer rod to get those fish out of those brush piles, off those big, deep rock piles and into their boat. But that doesn't mean you have to be a bass boat angler to throw a giant soft plastic worm. You can throw it in ponds as well. Now, if your pond is a max depth of six to seven feet and there's absolutely zero offshore structure, nothing off of the bank besides mud, a big worm might not be the best thing to throw. But if you've got brush piles, if you've got lay down trees that are farther deep into the water, maybe trees that somebody sank or they floated from a flood, or you've got rock piles or cinder blocks or tires that people sunk in the middle of your pond or lake, that is a great place to throw a big worm, especially in the summer. I'm not saying it can't work during other times of the year, but you're gonna see tons of footage throughout the rest of this summer of me throwing big worms offshore to catch the biggest fish in those schools. Well, my goodness, folks, what a video. Hopefully, if you've stuck around all the way to the end here, you enjoyed it and learned something to become a better fisherman. Now, I will have all the tackle, rods, reels, everything I talked about linked down in the video description. If y'all could purchase your tackle using those links down below, it would help my channel continue to grow. And if you wanna watch my jig masterclass video where I go super in-depth on how to fish jigs, what's a jig, why to fish jigs, it's kind of structured similar to this video, I will leave that link right here or click the box in the corner. My name is Tyler. As always, it's a pleasure and we'll see you guys next time right here on TRF.